Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Started? So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, enabling a brand aligned experience with the L&D strategic framework. I had to say that a couple, I had to practice that one a couple of times, <laughs> it's a tough title. My name is Sue Martin and I'm with GP Strategies and I'm happy to be your host for this session. Before we get started, I just wanna cover a few housekeeping items. Everyone's lines have been muted and this webinar is being recorded. We'll send you a link to the recording within 24 hours of this webinar. If you have any technical issues, please submit them directly to me in the chat as your host so I can help you. And finally, we want this time to be as interactive as possible. So we encourage you to contribute to, during today's webinar. If you have any comments during the presentation, please use the chat to engage with our presenter and our other attendees. If you have any questions, use the Q&A option. And if we can, we'll respond to them during the session or we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. So I really appreciate everyone joining today. I'm excited to introduce you to today's presenter, Matt Donovan. As the CLO at GP Strategies, Matt brings more than 25 years of experience. Throughout his career, he has helped support a wide range of global Fortune 500 companies through significant transformation initiatives. Not only has he been recognized through industry awards, his articles are regularly published and presented at a variety of national and international conferences. He has an MS in Instructional Systems Technology from Indiana University. We have a great discussion planned for today. Matt, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Thanks, Sue. Appreciate it. And um, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of help keep an eye on the chat. And I just wanted to re-encourage everyone to please make this as interactive as possible, uh, posting questions as we're going through. I will kind of stop and kind of give a moment as we're going through. If you do anything pops, we also have kind of a little bit of a Q&A session at the end, but uh, it doesn't just have to be with myself. Please engage with each other. Would love to see a lively chat as we're going through uh, the session today. I'm actually joining you from beautiful New York City today. I'm here on West 32nd Street at the Yard, which is a nice little uh, cooperative workspace. So glad to be with everyone today. And we're going to be talking about one of my favorite things, which is really focusing on how to create a brand aligned learning experience. But let's first start off with a little bit of, of why are we seeing such an urgency around this and why, why it's, it's been out there that we know that we want to create great experiences for our learners to create, you know, engagement and, and ultimately retention and transfer. But why is it becoming so important these days? And um, really, when you think about what's happened with the pandemic over the past couple of years, it's really pushed the employees to, you know, you know, not only change their expectations um, of, of what they want, the relationship they have, but we're seeing that volatility around the when, the where, and how we work. So, so the nature of the work is changing. We also know that the motivations of the individual workers are changing as well, and the work environment. So this is one of those times where we have really seen the most disruptive change across all three elements. In order to really do that, you have to take a systemic view of how we look at this. And so I think that the more recent times have really pushed us to rethink as, as we have people pushed out across the organization, how do we engage them? So let's talk about a tale of two experiences. And I would love to see in the chat here in a minute, I'm gonna show you a couple, but I would love to see your vote, which one you see. But here it is, we're working with Awesome Gadget Company and they have these innovative products and they have a wow customer experience from beginning to end from initial purchase through tech support and then the new, the new repurchase or upgrading it is it's a, it's a wonderful experience that is an intentional series of of planned moments which really create and reinforce that customer passion and brand loyalty so let's think about, you know, we're going to be a new employee, we're joining Awesome Gadget Co. We love the products and here's our experiences. So we have the one on the left is that we had, well, I've joined on my first day, I had no manager connection. My laptop hasn't arrived. I have limited access. I'm already overdue for my compliance training. I don't even know how to log in to actually complete it. I have a full day of mind numbing webinars and I'm not really sure where to go to help versus the second experience, which is really looking at, 
you know, from a pre-boarding experience, you know, we have a welcome, we have a mentor match. So before I even arrive on my first day, I've had a positive engagement. I've found out who I'm going to be partnering with to mentor. I've got an ergonomic workstation set up because I'll be working from home. I have connected technology to get that set. Um, I had lunch with my manager on my first day, uh, an opportunity to kind of, you know, get in and connect with somebody. It's really a mobile first personalized learning path and then access to team collaboration site with a nice team greeting from, hey, this is where we do our work. This is where we collaborate. Welcome to the group. So in the chat, I would love to see um, which, how many of you have actually experienced the one on the left, the first one on the left? How many of you have experienced that? Go ahead and just pop it in the, uh, in the chat. Fantastic. Hey, Scott, good to see you joining us. Yeah, I think a lot of us have, have been in that position to experience that one on the left. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, I, I hear you with that. That is that is the sad, sad truth. How many of you have experienced an experience on the right? So so you may have had an experience with both. Has anybody had the one on the right? Four out of five. So we'll switch to the one on the right. Yes, that's good. We're starting to see hopefully a little bit more around that um, it becomes more prevalent is that experience on the right. And, and with the great resignation, the, the concept of new employee onboarding and hiring is becoming such a critical experience. And we're seeing all this transition and we're seeing experiences now with new companies that are popping up from both conditions. And we, we see currently a lot more of on the left than what we're seeing on the right. Now, where I'm really talking about this is when I talk about a brand aligned experience, um, that's the one on the right. So it's a great customer experience. You have a great product. We're coming out. We're being a part of, uh, I'm, I'm excited to join as an employee. And, and it's aligned with the experience we put out with the product, the brand, the company. That's what's on the right. The one on the left is what I call a brand shattering experience. So it's like, I believe in the product. I believe in the company. I, I have an expert. I come in and I have a really, um, you know, perpendicular experience on my first day within that. So this is kind of where I'm coming back to say that in, you know, in the experience, it's more important than ever that we not only create the brand aligned experiences, but because we're more hybrid, more at a distance, it's harder to actually recover from the one on the left. Now, I know that there was a, a hand raised, I believe, and I think you were just um, voting with that, I believe. I don't know that I saw the hand still up. Is there a hand still up? Sue, could you just let me know if somebody had a question? I don't see it. Okay, I think she was just voting with her raised hand. Fantastic. So, all right. So, yeah, so this is really kind of the premise of what we're going to be talking about from here on out is saying, what do we need to do to really create more of the experiences on the right and, le and less of the ones on the left? So, all right, let's kind of jump into this. So, really what we talk about is creating a learner experience playbook. That's really what we're talking about is saying that if you have a customer experience playbook, why wouldn't you have a learner experience playbook? So where I talk about that, that intentional series of customer touch points that create that wow experience, that's the same kind of thing you want to build for your learners, whether they're experiencing a micro, like a singular micro video or, or all experiencing a multi-week MOOC. You know, how do you have a consistently great experience um, despite the modality, despite the way you're connecting with the partners on that one? So the idea is really, how do you create a learner experience playbook, which guides your designers, your developers, your delivery personnel, everybody in the learning organization and all the components within it are working together to reinforce that fantastic learner experience, that intentionality around it. Um, and so part of this is understanding that the structure of the L&D organization, and, and this is our L&D framework. These are 11 elements that we feel that need to be in place that, that enable the organization to deliver on that promise of a brand aligned experience. So out of this, um, and there's, it's just a real high level set of descriptions on this, but it's everything you'll see in here from governance to 
organ effective and, and development. So what's the culture? What's your change management strategies? There's some things wrapped into that. Operationally, how are you structured? How will you deliver? How do you administer? How do you report? Pulling some things out like that. How do you align with the business partners? You know, are, is it a federated model, a centra, uh, centralized, decentralized model? But how are you getting the insights from the business for both, you know, the decision making and the decision, the input as to what you need, as well as the budget to be able to funding to execute on this, but that alignment with your business partner is absolutely critical. How are you going to maximize that to ensure that continuity? Um, learning, you know, what do you know about your learners? You know, thinking about the profiles, the learner experience that you want to have, the digital learning strategy, all of that within that kind of, how are you going to design great experiences? Leadership, technology, how do you create a, a tech stack that's going to reinforce a seamless frictionless experience that really promotes the desired um, high impact experience you want to put in place. Innovation, how are you going to continue to productively pivot as, as the environment changes, you want to bring in a new technologies or you want to shift your methodology? How do you do that in a proactive, productive way so that you can be evidence-based in bringing it in? Talent management alignment, this one's really growing significantly as we're seeing more around the topics of talent mobility and integrating a concept like talent mobility, which deals with you know work culture issues like talent hoarding, or how do you culturally change an organization to promote the, the, the mobility in the organization, but also enabling the, the employees to think about what it is they need to get for that next skill, those skills for the next job as they're moving forward. So um, just kind of working through that organizational and then measurement and analytics. So these are the 11 dimensions of a, an organization that you kind of want to think through that you actually are ensuring that you have a great experience. So now we've been talking about a learner experience playbook as we're going through here. So there's, you know, this is a, a shortened element of an expression. So this, just like you have style guides and you have brand guidelines, this is about how you actually um, capture and convey the learner experience so that designers, developers, delivery, um, administration, everybody is on the same page about what we're trying to deliver in terms of an experience. So there's six components. We first start off with really, who are you designing for? That's the first body. We're really trying to understand the learner segmentation, personas about who we're building for. And then what are we solving for them at the high level? What are we trying to achieve for them? And then the next one is really the narrative of the broader learning journey. So what does good look like as they engage with the learning function inside of the organization? What do those touch points look like from beginning to end to being able to find what I need, to be able to know how I've progressed, to find what's next? The whole entire experience, what does good look like in terms of that experience? Alignment with business outcomes. Now, number three and number six really tie together well. Uh, but number three really says, what are you trying to help them solve, achieve, or perform? So it's it's in the end, what are you trying to help them really, um, I'd say, leverage the learning that you're providing to transfer that to the workplace to drive outcomes? What are you really helping them solve? And number six comes back about how you're actually going to measure how well did you deliver on that promise to help them solve that problem, achieve or perform? How will you measure the, the efficacy of the solutions you're putting out, but also the process that you put out there to continuously grow and develop them? So three and six really come together. One's the, think of it as one is like setting it up, what we think we need to measure. And number six is how we're going to execute, pull and bring that back and forth. So um, uh, number four really is those key learner touch points, the engagement, the entry, the re-entry, a, a range of moments of learning need. Um, those are really some of the bigger pieces that we want to think about mapping it out overall across the experience. So whether you're at an enterprise or at a functional level, how will you basically work for your target audience as they enter the experience, leave and come back? And number five is really mapping the learning environment. This is looking at your technology from beginning to end. How are you, you know, using technology to bring them in, 
to basically um, get them into the learning experience or push the learning experience into the work environment. So let me just pause here and see if there's any questions so far um, with any questions with what you're seeing here. Or actually, let me just also ask one question for you as well, see if there's any questions you may have. But I would love to see if, if any of these, does anybody out there have a learner experience playbook that they've currently used in some format or another? Mariana, I appreciate, I love this, um, you know, that the looks of good comes before solutioning. I love that. And, and we're really talking about a systemic description of the system that we put in place, not the actual pieces and parts in it. That guides those designers to build the pieces, to build the parts, but everything that's built or delivered is in alignment with that overall system description. I love that. Natasha, you have something similar, but didn't call it a learner experience playbook, but I love to see that we're really talking about, if we're gonna talk about here's our style guidelines, here's our brand guidelines, why wouldn't we have experiential guidelines? So, um, but, uh, and I'm glad to have that we, we can actually add in some of those elements we have there. Anybody else? Uh, let's see, we have a couple of folks that say no. Um, anybody else wanna share if they have any? Now, interestingly enough, I know some of you have worked with what I would consider uh, high touch marketing companies and, you know, the concept of the customer experience is in, in the retail space is something that's very prevalent. So there is a, an intentionality in trying to align this that most businesses have customers and most businesses are very intentional how they work with their customers. So we're really trying to leverage what we should have been doing as good you know, designers of learning systems, really bringing that forward into something that aligns with what businesses are doing every day. And, uh, and Deb, thanks for sharing as well that, you know, really figuring out the coordination and the alignment across the business stakeholder groups. Absolutely. And, and what we're seeing today is that with the constant shifting of the organization, the reorganization, all of that, we're seeing some stressors. So as you're trying to map those business stakeholders um, with a constantly shifting, it's really hard to sometimes get sustainability or traction. So that may be something that if you have a highly volatile space where your stakeholders are shifting constantly, you know, how do you actually create a system that enables them to, even when they get in, they can get traction. So it's not tied to one person. They can actually uh, move into a little more of an infrastructure that allows them to participate well. But uh, great, great conversation. I, I love seeing that um, really how important this is for us to get this right. And uh, yeah, I can't, I can't really, I think, emphasize enough the importance for measurement and feedback. This is how you gain credibility with the business. It's not about opinions. It's not about learning theories. The question is, is it moves it out of to, I have an opinion, they have an opinion. The measurement and feedback allows you to not only prove, but improve the experiences you're going on. Because the assumption that you're going to get it right the first time, let me just tell you, perfection is not an option. You'll have continuous improvement, but that measurement and feedback framework allows you to do that in a sustainable way. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So please keep the comments coming. I'd love to see the chat popping in here. Yes, six is the hardest. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. But I've also found it some of the most rewarding as well when you do it right, because I've, I've had some of the best conversations with my business partners when I talk about the measurement side. All right. So let's talk about the stakeholders. I know we talked a little bit about um, the stakeholders. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, who who is in our group of stakeholders? Sometimes in the learning space, we think about SMEs. They give us the content, we go build the courses. So clearly SMEs are stakeholders. Um, yeah, a little bit about the learner target audience. We historically talked a little bit about learner characteristics. Um, give us a little bit about how, how effective the solution is based off of what we know about them. But your A performers, you know, who is doing the job or the role really, really well? Being able to find those, to understand what makes a great performance 
in that space? What are the behaviors, the skills that kind of come into that? So in thinking not just about content, but also getting back to transfer and application, what does that look like? And then even taking a step back, looking at the broader performance support network all the people that enable the work experience and a new employee onboarding you have the onboarding manager you may have a group uh, support person you may have the hr person over this you may actually have a recruiting person as well that's that's getting them as they go from hey i've signed on to the company to a little bit of pre-boarding to getting your job to moving into the work with that so you have a system of folks that are enabling you know, not only the new employee onboarding, but a range of the learner experiences. You've got to think about all of the humans that actually enable the system to, to work well. Um, coaches, mentors, anybody else I would put in this category. And obviously the business stakeholders, they're going to help define the business success criteria. They're going to talk about the performance flow, a lot of that coming in as well. So um, it, it really is the ability to... Um, to kind of look at broadening your base of stakeholders so that you can start to get a full, what I would say, a fully informed perspective on, you know, how do we, you know, design the learner experience from the multiple dimensions that we need to think about. So these are all examples of stakeholders. I've had a couple other folks have always shared more. If you have some others, it's a great, um, you know, send them along, share them as well. I can either fit them in a group or add them in a new one as I kind of learn about. But the idea is to kind of think beyond our traditional and really look at a partnership ecosystem. I love the way you kind of phrase that. That's fantastic. All right. So this is when we talk about starting to create an experience. Now we're starting to look at how do I create the ecosystem that wraps around this? Um, in my introduction on the slide, I refer to myself as a recovering instructional designer. I'm classically trained. I have a master's in instructional design, and I have designed and developed, uh, I mean, thousands of hours of instruction, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Um, and I have created some really awesome things. I've created some things that would bore people to death. But the fact of the matter is, is there's a way that you think differently about your design from traditional instructional design. When you think about traditional instructional design, it's a systematic approach to creating an output, an instructional output. And that's it's not a bad thing. But what you start to miss with a focus on the systematic is that we lose the systemic. And this is really in a modern learning experience. We're trying to look at how do you build the system? the things that wrap around the actual learner, the pieces and parts we put into there. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to create an experience or a journey that creates space for the learner to pull into, that allows them to actually take ownership for the learning journey. One of the first rules of a modern learning experience is that the modern learner has to take accountability. That in and of itself is actually a culture shift for a lot of organizations, helping the learners that they need to take accountability. Now, I want to be, I want to caution when I say that is that, you know, you can't, as an organization, you can't actually ensure relevance, but you can create the conditions for relevance in order to make something ruthlessly relevant. The learners have to be able to step in and make that connection of this is why it's important for me. This is how it's going to help be helpful for me to make that connection around that. Our goal is to kind of build the experience around that that allows them to step in and own that journey. So what you look at here, for example, is a sample of an emotional intelligent learning components, things that we would wrap around a learner or a group of learners as they're going through to learn more about emotional intelligence. So we have a range of things. We have tools. We have, um, you know, basics on some definitions of principles. We have a chat bot that may come through, a curated skill path. Um, we've got, um, you know, you know, input from influencers. We've got virtual communities to build out those areas. We've got a manager's toolkit. So think of it as a system that wraps around them and allows them to kind of get in and, and, and own that. So this kind of builds around it. And here's an example of what it starts to look like in action. So as you look at this, we started off with Sarah. Sarah's, uh, let's say she's a single parent. 
um, and she wants to, you know, know that she wants to progress and she's heard that, you know, emotional intelligence is a critical skill, especially for future positions. She wants to ensure that she has viability for future jobs. She wants to move forward. She wants to continue to grow. But what is this emotional intelligence thing? So we set up a journey. This is just a sample journey of how it would unfold under time. So one path that she could take is maybe she sees a sign in the elevator or she saw a banner on the actual, um, on the uh, internet that, that she popped in and says, you want to learn more about it. She's able to kind of click on a QR code. It pops up some videos that are available. She watches some animations some testimonials from her peers and leaders. And we've worked in a range of voices that says, here's why I found emotional intelligence. Here's how it's helped me personally, professionally. Here's how it's helped me grow into new positions. So she's starting to understand how others find it invaluable and how they use it. And she's also able to see a range of voices. I think this is what's important is that creating space for other folks that may resonate with her emotionally, that may resonate with her from a background or an experience level. Maybe there's another single parent out there who says, you know, I have found it not only helps here, but it's also helped in, in other interactions that I may have, whatever. It's, it gives an opportunity rather than just the authoritative voice of the organization saying, this is emotional intelligence. Here's how you will use it, it allows more voices to come forward. And part of what we want to do is actually pull Sarah into this journey and allow her to actually contribute her voice to this. So as she experiences some of these things, she can actually leave kind of that digital breadcrumb for others that follow in the past as she shares, here's what I found helpful. Here's what I love to do. Here's the sequence. Maybe she took some of these things. Maybe she takes only a handful of them. She decides she moves forward in the next one here. And we're talking about the, the self-assessment. So it's a really brief, you know, a diagnostic says, hey, or what are you interested in? How much do you, do you have five minutes? Do you have 35 minutes? Do you want to do a deep dive? So it's like, where can I learn more? Where can I focus? What type of assets that I could have to help me on my journey? So she's able to do that. She can also opt in that we've got a nice emotional intelligence chat bot that she can get into and it will um, intelligently automate communications and share information with her about things to think about, pulsing small little messages over time. Uh, she could download the 30 days of emotional intelligence calendar, which we could download into her Outlook environment. So she would actually be able to have it in there and she could do a small emotional intelligence activity every day in a month, for example. So there's a range of these ways that we are bringing um, these elements together. Um, you know, she also joins and collaborates in a community space. Um, she's can download articles again, and then she sees that there's more content, more experiences coming. So she can kind of tag this as a place that she wants to grow and learn more about. She could go into a deep dive with a cohort that is spaced learning over time that really allows her to dig in and, and talk with others and share with others in real time uh, or near real time. So like a semi-synchronous activity where she can share and grow with others within a set time window. So um, the idea here really is that that we're trying to do two things and that gets back into being able to show how things actually really grow and flow over time. So from a traditional instructional design, we often think about sequencing and chunking uh, are, are common practices that we do. Now you're bringing in intentionality around flow, ecosystem design and support. We're changing what we're putting in this place. So um, let me pause. Thoughts, reactions. How do you guys react to this? Does this make sense? You can also challenge me as well. If you see something that just doesn't make sense or to you, I'd love to you know, see if we chat a little bit about that. So, And I like the visualization. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. And this, this is a visualization. This is a really good point that as we build more complex learning journeys and we, we invite and encourage the learner to take ownership with this, being able to communicate and experience visually to quickly get a range of information is absolutely critical. So not just being able to put it out in text, but can you show a picture? Can you allow them to scan, get a layout? Can you have them be able to click into something to learn more so it has elaboration opportunities? But absolutely, it's, it's an important way that we think about bringing in the visual messaging into the experience itself 
not just the actual learning experience. But, but again, that's where we try and get back to, to say, you know, if I want to create a great learning experience, but I want you to participate, make it easy for me to figure out what this, what the rich set of assets I have, what are the outcomes? How do I use them? So um, Mick, I love this. It's great. Is there a personalization component to make the learner feel like you're communicating with them on a one-on-one -on -one level? Absolutely. Actually, if you look in here, there are a couple of places um, from a personalization, there is the um, self-assessment or the diagnostic that allows them to personalize the path that they go into. Um, the chat bot can be more or less personalized based off of data gathered with the learner to help direct them to things. We've seen push bots, pull bots, push and pull bots um, that, that can shape that experience. So we use small tools to be able to provide that personalization. Now, not everything in here is personalized, but the journey itself can be. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, it's a really good question to say, can you do something like this for a compliance program? That's a great, I mean, it was a great question to come out. Can we make this engaging? If you think that uh, uh, compliance is really about trying to get pure behavior on the end, um, then, then a more systemic look at why and how people actually perform is absolutely critical. So, so for example, I worked with a pharmaceutical company that really wanted to beef up adverse event reporting. So, so you have a, a drug device interaction and something happens um, by, you know, most uh, you know, regulatory bodies require that, that, that you track this information. But if I need people in the company to make sure that they're not only when they hear about them, they're reporting them well and bringing them through, it's not just the instruction and the information on how do I do this well, what is the form? Where do I fill it out? You also provide additional supports like a hotline to be able to do that. You also provide folks that are champions that can help you gather the right information to be able to do that. So you look systemically at the entire process. So even though there's a compliance component that everybody hears about a uh, an adverse event or a serious adverse event, you need to report you've put a full system in there that allows you to not only convey what's important, why it's important, you've given them the tools that make it easy to do that. Um, you can now track and monitor more effectively. You give them feedback on the completion of the task. So, so you're instead of trying to focus on training, carrying the bulk of the load, you're really looking at a full performance system. So, and we've looked at them from everything to like anti-money laundering to um, fishing practices. So incorporating more of that full range of experiential elements into not just learning, but performance. And that's, that's I think, one way how we start to think different about compliance, just like check the box, to do I really want to change behaviors in the field? So it's a great question. But can we show how those different pieces would pull together in a visual to help people understand the system? That, that's a great way in there. Um, Phil, love to see this. It's uh, um, another piece is the acknowledgement from the Oregon leadership that this is valuable time. I love that. You are absolutely right. Um, Phil, that we all know that you can create the best instruction, the most engaging, but if the leadership and their management doesn't reinforce that it's important to take the time, that this is an important commitment, usually culture will eat design and strategy for breakfast. So you have to really be able to kind of keep that consistent all the way through. Um, I love uh, this, uh, keep the experience going. We need to have a motivational arrow in parallel that if one goes up aided by the positive feedback loop, I like that. So how do you kind of keep motion? Now, you, that's a great idea. So not only do I have a singular flow, but how do I add, for example, thinking through this like little bit of, of um, you know, energy or motivation motion. So how do I kind of repulse out or reinforce because Sarah's journey could be over two years. I mean, she could take one of these and then come back next year. She could take them all in a six month window. But the idea is how do you kind of keep that motivation pushing through for her as well as her managers? Um, so kind of tying back the two, one of the things you could think about is like, think of a manager's tool um, uh, toolkit that says for the manager's meeting, we can have have a great conversation and it's like 15 minutes of your manager's meeting. Here's a 15 minute conversation, a video and an activity you could do with your team. Maybe you have a, a, a weekly or a monthly team meeting. Here's one agenda item you could do to kind of pulse that along. 
brings in that management reinforcement. It makes it easy for them to participate and continue to message. And it, it can be spaced out over time that kind of keeps the engine going. So I, I love the conversation on this. Thanks guys for kind of keeping pushing this along. Um, great ideas. Uh, I'm gonna keep adding those to my list of, um, list of uh, improvements as we're going through. So yes, back to the systems approach, absolutely. All right, let me keep pushing forward here. Um, this one's really important And this. If you've seen some of my things in the past, this has probably been something more recently that I've been talking about uh, because I think it's really important as we talk a lot about newer technologies, newer features coming on place. Sometimes we think that we can use technology to transactionalize the experience. We can just make it easier and and less of the human energy that we need to do and I, well i think there's a lot of good ideas around being able to use intelligent automation to take some of the more mundane activities and allow the humans in the system to do more significant moments of connection and reinforcement we've got to keep the humans in the system um, so i'm kind of bringing together three concepts here the moments of learning need um, i love uh, Godforsen and Mosher's really starting off with that learner centric simple question of um, at, what are the different types of moments when I need to learn something and odds are to match that moment I probably need it in a different format a different style a different approach so that's really the beauty of their design with the five moments where you know learning for the first time requires probably more context more setup for the learner probably re more, re requires more focused attention probably a little bit of time to 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 think about it let it marinate um, as I'm building my scaffolding or my understanding around it, then I can learn more, add more to that structure. But, but then when I get out in the field and I'm applying or I'm trying to get better at it um, or something changes or something goes wrong, I don't need all that context. I need very specific types of instruction or, or performance support that helps me get better at perfect application or I need to say something's changed. I just need the answer on how do I address the change in the environment? Either what are other people seeing and how are they responding to it? Or what have other people solved around it? Or how can I address that change? Or when something goes wrong, how do I find something specifically on that? I don't need to go back to the history of the concept for the past 30 years. I need to figure out how to get a quick answer for what I need to do. So the nice part about those five moments of need is it really sets up different rationales as to why I need that and the learning systems we put in place. Again, back to the systems view, we want to build a journey that meets them at each of those moments as they progress through them. The last two I've thrown in here, uh, I think because they are, are a little different than the first five, the first five are really what I call performance norming. They're all about us being able to, you know, I have work and I have a task and this is what I want to do and I need to get better at it. So it's really helping me be a better performer on a specific task. I added in the, the two moments because these are more intrinsically driven. I need to innovate or I need to grow for the next role, which means I'm doing something different than what I'm currently focused on right now. Um, I refer to the first five here as really convergent. It's converging to get you to a better performance. It's, it's coming together at helping you be better at that job. The last two are what I call divergent. You know, don't send me the same things that I had before. So this is important because we have systems. So we think of like um, Netflix is just something we're probably pretty familiar with. It says, if you like this movie, get more of this. So if you're doing this job, let me send you this type of information. Other people in your job like this information. That's convergent. So it keeps sending you information that's predictable. What if I need to see something different? I need to innovate. I need something new. That's divergence. So when you're thinking about your learning systems, you need to be able to think about how do I get them to break the algorithm, to find the things beyond what is currently recommended to me. And that's a whole new system. So you want to kind of bring in that allows you for convergence and divergence. And that's really where it's going to be important. But moving on, so, so really to meet these moments, three, four, five, and I would argue innovation and growing for the next role, these really are fed 
by the expanded learner roles. Historically, we've had the, the relationship where orgs, organization will provide you everything you need to do your job and the learners were just traditionally consuming, which was the first role. So if you were going to do accounting, we got an undergrad accounting major comes into the company and we'll teach you how to do accounting here at the company. And then you're an accountant for the next five years. It's, it's kind of set up to be that way. But the way that we've seen disruptions in the jobs, the roles, the skills, how they're blending, the mashups, all of that is shifting. It's the shelf life is going down dramatically on that. But the way you meet the applying, getting better at, at applying or, or adjusting the change or failure, you now have to bring in the rest of the employees, the performers, the learners, the workers, everybody in to help solve that problem. And this is where social learning really comes in because they're not just consumers. They are moderators, curators, contributors, creators, collaborators. They are actively contributing to the learning ecosystem. And that's critical. So this is what I was talking about becoming a recovering instructional designer. When we used to focus on the things we created, we created things to be consumed. Now our new job is to create experiences which enable you to pull in and be a moderator, a curator, a contributor, bring in folks to help kind of create the content instead of you building all the content yourself. So you're expanding those learning roles because honestly, that's the only sustainable way an organization really meets moments three, four, or five. And then the additional two that I put in there, in my opinion, is by pulling from the broader population. So reinforcing social learning is absolutely fundamental. Now, the third box here on the right is really where I look at the reference, what I call a connected learning organization. And this is where it kind of shifts and, and starts to look at these are the humans in the system that make all the difference. These are not titles that sit on an org chart. And, and, and sometimes these folks, when a business may contract, we lose them because they are intangible skill sets, not often identified. But here, let me break down a little bit what I mean by this. Now, this is all inspired from Rob, Wurst, Rob Cross's work on collaboration. It really pulls from uh, the domain around organizational network analysis, which is the study of how work, how companies collaborate. So the workers in an organization collaborate to get work done. I'm pulling it to say, are there parallels and how um, employees in an organization connect and collaborate to learn in order to perform? So um, Rob's work really inspired me on this to kind of think about this. So looking at, you know, the role of the learning connector. Simple enough, this role is, everybody's seen this. If I have to do something in my organization, I got to figure out how to fill out a form, do X, Y, Z, find something. There's somebody in the organization I call. I pick up the phone and we all have this person, who do I call? I mean, all the help support in the system in the universe, but usually I have a person I call. That's what we call the learning connector. They're within the unit or the organization in the unit. And they, they're able to kind of make connections to the things within the unit to help answer common questions that are out there. Um, usually this is not always a you know, help desk person. We say, hey, this person will answer all your questions. These are people who really are good at making connections, have experience and can do that. So, so those are within the unit. When you have people that say, hey, we don't have the answer to that here, but I know of other business units or other areas or industries or groups, these are your bridgers, people that bring in insights and information and resources from other units in the organization. These people are natural collaborators, natural folks that, that have those connections, have an understanding of the system and can help make that connection. Um, specialists for coaching and mentoring. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about coaching and mentoring within the concept more of micro coaching or micro mentoring and, and the concept that in my lifetime, I probably need 15 coaches more than I need two coaches. And what I mean, like my general physician, when I go and see them, they may identify that uh, something's wrong with me. I need to go see a specialist. So I go and see an ear, nose and throat, or I go see a, a foot guy, whatever. There is somebody else out there. So 
you know, while I may have one generalist coach to kind of help, there's a system of coaches and mentors that can help me with specific challenges, certain types of outcomes, things like that. So specialists for coaching and then the information brokers are the ones that have access to the information that helps fuel what we need to be able to achieve, accomplish, um, uh, to learn, to grow within that. So these are the ones that I'm advocating. These are humans in the system. So in the digital learning systems that we are building, we got to carve out space. We got to uncover, nurture, and reinforce these folks because when a business wants to grow and transform, the, this is where it happens. These are the ones that can help that organization grow, shift, and transform. I've seen lots of organizations that have gone through a lot of con contraction and expansion, and they, they have lost some of these folks. And when they go back to grow, even though they have great information systems, they have you know, uh, really robust you know, online portals and things, there's still that lack of that ability to kind of bring things together to make it relevant for me to say, I just need that little extra piece that brings it together for me that personalization, that another human that understands my context. That's really what that's about. So, so this is another component about really creating that, that full on brand aligned learning experience. Don't forget the humans. It's a, it's a critical. And I'm excited because I think more than ever, we're seeing that we need to have this. So um, Leanne, I think it looks like you have a question here. So how do you leverage internal resources without increasing operational risk? Ah, Great. Ways to monitor social learning. <clears throat> That's a really good question. Um, boy, I could do a whole session on how to cultivate a, a, a social learning community and around that. But I will say in highly regulated experience or uh, environments, I will also say in <clears throat> government or, or um, you know, defense industries, which have a lot of that, I have still seen social learning work. You just have to put in guidelines. But where that helps is with those that are at the humans that are helping create the communities, reinforce the communities, being able to kind of help learners understand the rules of the community and be able to manage that. So it does take energy and effort to help, help grow that. You have to tend to that garden. That is important for that to be out there and be available. So so great question. It is something you do need to think about. You just don't enter into a social community lightly, but it is a very powerful tool when done well. Let me just. Um, hey, Matt. See, yeah. yeah. This is Sue. So I just wanted to address um, a comment that Mariana um, posted yeah. around consistency under your connected <laughs> learning roles. So I'm, I'm all about consistency. So I love this, Mariana. <laughs> so replacing your specialists with learning catalysts and yes. your information brokers with learning brokers. I think that's a great idea. Oh, I, I love it. That. I love yeah. it. That's a great, great recommendation. I like that. Um, no, it's, it's good. And I'm always, like I said, continuously improving. So, so those kind of suggestions are extremely welcome. So thank you. Uh, Sue, are there any others in there that I missed? That we I don't think so. On? I think we're good. I think we're, we're okay. good date. Okay. All right. No, that's good. All right. Well, let me keep pushing ahead here. And so when I talk a lot about um, setting up, like I talked about brand style, brand guidelines, style guidelines, this is an example of how you would start to create what I would call sample guiding principles. So these are saying not how do we design the video or the MOOC or the WBT uh, or the, the classroom training. This talks about what should it feel like? So what guides the designs that we want to have in here? So every learning event, element, asset that we put out there, we want to make sure that it is ruthlessly relevant. And these are samples. The idea is that you go through your organization and figure out what are your guiding principles towards the design of the experience. So is it real? Is it authentic? Does it tie to the company transformation? Each piece, is it clear to me how this will further the strategy, my personal agenda, what I'm trying to achieve, whatever? You know, that's one we often talk about is really getting towards a ruthless relevance around that, creating a cultural, a contextual fit to help me understand what's coming in it. That's an example of what it could be around relevancy, creating connections. Everything we want to, whether it's a small piece or a bigger piece, how does it fit into the fabric of a larger connection or a connected network out there? Uh, respecting time. 
Learner time is valuable. It, it is probably one of our most precious commodities. You know, simultaneously, we have more information, more learning events than we ever have, but we have less time to actually execute with this. So we want to make sure we, we create time, manage your buy-in, all of that. So these are examples, generate, pull, enable insights. Um, we, we want them to be able to feel that they can kind of come into it, be pulled through it, take ownership of the experience. You know, you're going to continuously reinforce that, enable insights. Everything needs to be able to be measured. How will we know whether it's, you know, it, it's working or how to, through evidence, actually improve it intelligently as we're moving forward. So these are just sample guiding principles. The idea is that you would go through an exercise with your organization to say, this is what we want our experience to be. Um, so the, these are key components within that. Um, let me see, let's take it here. So the three layers of relevance, I, I've talked quite a bit about ruthless relevance, and, and I, I'm a big fan of this. If you've heard me before, I've often talked a lot about it. But here's what I call the three layers of relevance, and there's probably four or five or six out there. But let's take the concept of, of, of business acumen as we look at this. So when I think of business acumen, my first layer is, you know, for example, financials, reading financial statements are part of business acumen. So I might start off with what does an income statement look like? What can an income statement tell you? And, and this content is readily available. You can find it. You, you can borrow this content uh, or you can buy this content at low, low price to be able to put this in. This is not something an instructional designer needs to tell you, but it's the first level of what is an income statement? What's a cash flow statement? What's a balance sheet? What does it tell you? All of that is pretty readily available. When we see a lot of curation platforms, we see a lot of content catalogs, a lot of what we see is in this first layer of relevance. It's, it's generalized, it, it's available across the board. And, and my point is, is don't recreate this first layer, it's available out there, but it's not enough to stop at the first layer. The second layer now comes into, for example, what does our income statement look like? And what does our income statement tell you? And if you know anything about financial statements, they are all generally structured, but it's how your organization or your company does business. It, it's, it's, you've got to know the business to really understand the income statement, to understand how to really read it. Um, you know, what, what's really happening behind the numbers that you're seeing in there. So this one, as you can imagine, you probably can't get from a LinkedIn learning catalog to say, what does Acme company income statement tell you? It's not going to be out there. So this is something that would be great to be, you know, not only as an instructional design or, or a design team you could create, but this would be a great asset to have experts come in and start to share and contribute. So, so some of the other learners in the system could start to create their own narrative of what does our income statement, or here's how I look at our income statement, or here's how I read it. Now, layer three, for example, gets into how can I use the income statement to drive business decisions? And this is really where you get some really great, I think, insights from the practitioners in the, in the organization to kind of step in and says, here's what I use from the financial documents, plus our business decisioning model, plus the other data endpoints. This is how I drive evidence-based decisions to drive business outcomes. And this is where you really start to see the application happening. So this is when you think about the full range of building content in the system, the ecosystem, opening up the voices, opening up the sources, where you're going to probably spend more of your time to create or enable or share with others in the system to do. You're really going to focus on two and three, borrow, buy at low cost for, for level one to be able to do that. So, so again, it, it's not just thinking about just, just creating all of the content out there. It's really thinking systemically, finding these right leverage points to get what you need as efficiently and effectively as possible. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this one. This is about the tech ecosystem. The idea here that this, you know, a lot of folks ask me, could I make this really simple? Part of the message I have is here is that our tech learning tech ecosystem is becoming more complicated than ever. If you really just focus on the left column here, the, the left and the gray, the point of access, device and interaction, measurement analytics, what I try to do is to organize what is the intent of using each of these layers. So we know, for example, point of access, you want to provide a centralized point when a learner needs to learn something, where do they go? 
where do I start my learning journey? Where do I go back to my learning journey? How do I do that? So starting off with a point of access, you need a tool or a technology to enable that. You need to think about the end types of designs or devices in the end that you're going to be able to do. So you can create a seamless experience like Netflix. When I start a movie on my phone, I go to my iPad and then I go to my TV and then I, you know, to kind of finish that movie. And then maybe at night, I kind of go back to my phone as, as I'm falling asleep. It's a consistent experience across all the devices. Uh, measurement and analytics, the experience layer, which we've seen a huge explosion in the ways in which we engage learners to provide the information, push pull, um, VR, so immersive. There's a whole range of things in that space. So the first four really are about the points of interaction with the learner. The bottom two are behind the scenes. These are the things that the organizations need to think about. How are you going to manage, share, um, update, release, deliver the content? And then the bottom of the learning assets, really, these that's atomic building blocks out of it. Now, the the dark blue on the right here. This is the one we're seeing a lot of growth. It's really at the point of work and really in the collaborative workspaces, whether it's Slack or it's Teams, starting to think about how do you create uh, wraparound learning experiences that drive into the point of collaboration or the point of work, trying to be able to do that. So um, you, the idea is that you want to look through and think through and map how your tech ecosystem will play out for the first four layers of that 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 direct customer or learner experience and then underneath of it how you're enabling it through the management and at the point of work so both of those are really cool um, that you need to think about of course one of the things that was we talked about was measurements and this is a measurement map and it's a practice we use um, here at gp strategies which if you look at it starting off on the far right which is really about the most lagging business indicators so these are the things that that most often and we'll come around and say success of the business. So mapping that from the far right, working your way back from the business results to the leading behaviors or indicators up to the investment, which is really the solution that you put in place. The idea is that you're here to kind of create a causal chain, a causal logic chain that says, and trying to get to alignment, that if we are trying to say for job site safety, for example, that if I have supervisors, I look here, percent of supervisors completing safety training is high. And I can go through the indicators and say, yes, early on, these all these things are happening. Are we seeing the numbers of worker comp claims go down? Are we seeing a reduction in, in a number of work days that are lost due to an incident? You know, all these things give us the ability to say, is our investment contributing positively to these numbers? And then ultimately, the assumption is that if we hit these markers, it will get to, um, you know, profitability in the end. The real, the beauty here is that this, this, it's not that Kirkpatrick or um, uh, Jack was really wrong about, you know, the levels one through four, level you know, one through five for Phillips or Kirkpatrick. They never talked about sustainability. This is about being able to sustainably measure in the organization from beginning to end. All of these data points are data points that are usually already collected by the business. If I can show the causal chain and work in a couple of the learning elements, I'm automatically building out a sustainable approach to a level three and a level four evaluation that is more sustainable because I'm already collecting the data and aligning it back to the learning experience. And that's really the heart of it is, is that why do we not do a level three or a level four? It's too expensive. Am I going to go out and spend you know, $75,000 to figure out a $200,000 initiative worked or didn't work? Why would I do that? But let's build in more sustainable ways to kind of capture the data as we're going through this experience and really looking at the job site. You know, And this one's just a job site safety. You can do this for a variety of programs, but it allows you to get to that, what we talked about, box three and box four, or box six in, in, in the whole uh, learner experience map. It says, what do we want to help them get better at if it's job site safety? That's what we want to do. And then the other says, how will we actually measure it to know that we've been successful in it? We've answered it with this graphic here. So, um, and we have uh, other resources that are available. If you're interested in those, we can definitely get you some links to those. There's some great videos out there that talk more specifically about the measurement mapping process. Um, 
but I know we're getting close to time. I want to pull up the chat, see if I, there's a couple of questions I can answer uh, for folks. But um, I would love to have you. If you guys haven't connected with me already, please reach out and connect with me. I think it'd be fantastic to um, hear from you ongoing. I always look for new ideas, new insights out there. So, um, and yes, we will make the slides available. But um, I know we have about a minute or two. Is there any questions that I can answer or any other thoughts or feedback? So. Ooh, learning nudgers. I saw that one from Ariana. I like that. Social learning and tips. I like that one. Um, anyone else? Any other questions? Thanks to everybody. I, I appreciate all, all the thanks. It's great to see this. Uh, like I said, reach out. Would love to continue the conversation. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. I'll hang on here for just a minute or two more as we're kind of there. So if you want to sneak in a question or two, I'd be glad to. Sue, were you going to jump in? Yep. Just wanted to thank you for the great presentation and discussion and thank all of our attendees for the, the comments and great suggestions. I love it when it's this interactive. Um, and we're able to address those questions during the session. So great, great session. Um, so uh, uh, we, again, just want to thank you for your time and attention today. We hope you'll join us for another webinar. You can go to our website um, to, to see the future sessions. Um, and then if we don't have anything else, I don't, I don't see any questions in the Q&A and nothing else here. So I think we're good. I wish everyone a wonderful and productive day. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.